Good morning and welcome to the Institute for Government for this briefing on the energy market from Jonathan Brearley. I'm Hannah White and I'm director of the Institute. I'm delighted to welcome Jonathan here today. Uh, he is, of course, CEO of Ofgem, has been since February 2020 and has a, a long career with wide experience uh, in the energy sector, having uh, previously led electricity market reform at DEC and been director of the Cross-Government Office of Climate Change. Jonathan's going to speak today for around 40 minutes, and then I'll put a couple of questions to him before we open up uh, to questions from the floor and online. So please do start thinking up your questions. If you are online, please do send them in via Slido. And we'll be tweeting this event from <coughs> our IFG events account using the hashtag IFG Offgem. Uh, so please do use that hashtag if you are tweeting too. So I'll hand straight over to you, Jonathan. Brilliant. Thank you. So first of all, thank you, Hannah, and thank you to the IFG for inviting me here today. I have spent a lot of time here over the years talking about government policy, so it is great to be back. Now today, I'd like to talk about the future of our energy system, where we are, what lessons we have learned from the gas crisis, and what we need to do to shape the energy system of the future that we need to see. So let me start with where we are today. First, as always, I think we should acknowledge how difficult it is for many, many households and businesses to pay for the energy they need. Our data shows that from April, households on median disposable income will spend 10% of that on their energy bills, and those relying on the state pension will spend 29%. That is a truly extraordinary part of our household budgets. I speak to customers regularly, and even with the energy price guarantee and energy bills discount scheme, I know that the scale of the challenge for many people out there remains enormous. For example, a few months ago, I spoke to a lady who has a chronic condition. That condition often leaves her in pain if it is cold, yet often she has to rely on a hot drink or a blanket because she cannot afford to heat even one room. I have also spoken to people who prefer to be in hospital rather than going home because at least in hospital, they have access to the energy and food that they need. Now we also consult regularly with our business member groups to hear about the challenges they face. For example, we recently heard from a group of theatres whose long-standing utility contract ended last October. Their new forecast before government support was of a roughly 450% rise in their electricity bill and 725% rise in their gas bill. And when they tried to find alternative quotes, it was difficult for a whole range of issues, including a very different perception of credit risk. Now, sadly, these stories are all too common across Britain today. So as the energy regulator, alongside government and the industry, it is our responsibility to do everything we can to support consumers and businesses through this very difficult period. At the same time, at the start of winter, we worked hard with industry, government and national grids on risks to security of supply driven by the gas crisis. And we prepared for a wide range of scenarios. From where we stand today, some of the strategic risks that we saw a few months ago look to have eased. Mild weather, replenished gas stores across Europe and East Asia, and more benign conditions for energy trading, particularly in the improved outlook from France's nuclear fleet, have contributed to a challenging but more robust energy security position for the rest of winter. However, as today's events show, and indeed we have Fintan in the audience with us, and the fact that we are asking for demand response show that we need to remain vigilant and we need to maintain cautious about what may happen in the future. So we are vigilant, the system is getting more robust, but some of the risks still remain. Now these conditions have been matched with successful plans across Europe to reduce demand, and as you would expect, adjustments made by all consumers in response to the extraordinary prices that we've seen. Now overall, this situation has been reflected in a fall in gas prices over time, which we do expect to feed into customers' bills. However, the situation remains tough, with prices still three times higher than historic averages. And while we are away some way from the more shocking predictions we saw a few months ago, 
prices are unlikely to go back to the levels we saw pre-pandemic. We cannot predict the future, and we must continue to be vigilant and ready for a world where prices are high and are volatile. So Ofgem, National Grid, and stakeholders across government will continue to work closely together to mitigate risks and prepare for all scenarios. So in summary, things are better than we feared and are improving, but the challenges and difficulties for customers and for the industry are likely to be around for some time. Now, as you can imagine, I've been reflecting hard on what this grass crisis means for the situation in Britain and how we need to change our energy system. There is a great deal for all of us to learn in the energy sector. The industry, government, charities who support customers, and indeed the regulator. I would like to focus today on what I see as the two principal lessons and how we might address them in years to come. First and foremost, we should recognise that the thing that affects customers the most and puts us most at disadvantage as a country is reliance on international gas markets that bluntly have been manipulated by an aggressive state. Ultimately, we need to recognise that geopolitics is playing a stronger hand in this country's energy decisions than we had planned for or that we would like it to. My view is that we should move as rapidly as possible away from a system highly dependent on international gas, but also move away from our current market, which means that gas affects almost all of our energy use. Simply put, we need to transition towards more homegrown, secure and renewable sources of energy supply and design an electricity market that allows us to benefit from that transition. This will mean a rapid and well-planned transformation of our energy generation and the pipes and wires that support it, and a redesigned market that enables those who are able to be rewarded for moving their energy to times when it will be the cheapest, typically late at night or when renewables are producing through the wind and the sun, while also, of course, protecting our vulnerable customers. The second lesson that we need to learn is that we need fundamental change in our retail business model and the policy and regulation that sits behind it. This is because, as I have said, we need to assume that price volatility will continue in the coming years. And as we move through the energy transition, we need companies to be able to create clear offers to customers to encourage us to use our energy differently. This can only be achieved by well-capitalized and reasonably profitable companies. So let's start with the build out of the infrastructure that we need. To move away from our dependence on international gas markets and build the secure, decarbonized energy system that we need as rapidly as possible, and to meet the government's target to achieve a net zero power system by 2035 and reach net zero by 2050, we will need to build new energy infrastructure at a pace not seen for decades. When you look at our history, the period immediately after the Second World War most closely resembles the pace and scale that we need to build. From 1950 to 1970, Great Britain's electricity generation capacity expanded around fourfold its original size. Since then, the system has been largely stable in terms of our networks, and regulation has been designed to maintain that system and to drive efficiency in its maintenance and in the incremental bill that has been needed. But to meet the scale of future energy demand between now and 2050, we will need again to build out our infrastructure, onshore, offshore, and connecting to other countries at an extraordinary pace not seen for over half a century. This is a huge challenge but also a huge economic opportunity. As the recent Skidmore review rightly emphasised, for businesses and investment, that will cost us more if we delay. But to make that work, to achieve that, we need a different approach. In particular, we need a holistic assessment of our evolving energy needs, how best to fulfil them, and a holistic plan for the network that will be needed, both nationally and likely regionally. 
The creation of the future system operator is designed to do just this. Its role should be wide ranging and within the objectives set by government, it should have the authority to design that strategic plan of the infrastructure needed. Our role as Ofgem should retreat a little and we should focus on ensuring that that infrastructure, once planned, is delivered as efficiently as possible, either through our regulation or through competitive tendering. At a regional level, it is likely that the system operator will need to do the same and to start proactively setting the planning parameters for network companies as they build their own more detailed plans. With that plan in place, I believe we can vastly increase the pace of investment and the pace of our infrastructure build. Indeed, we have already shown why this approach will work and how this approach will work. In December, Ofgem accelerated, launched the Accelerated Strategic Transmission Investment. This is around £20 billion of new investment in our transmission network, the major wires that carry, carries our electricity across the country. This was largely based on the design laid out by the nascent system operator in advance, targeting the connection of the 50 gigawatts of offshore wind we expect to build by 2030. In short, what in business as usual might have taken Ofgem years to approve took a matter of months. Once we had the confidence that these proposals were laid out in a well-researched, well-evidenced, holistic assessment of Britain's needs. Critical to this approach is anticipating generation. So the grid is ready when generation is ready to connect, as opposed to the prior, much more incremental approach. Overall, this will reduce time to deliver those large transmission projects by between two or three years. Of course, that time saved depends on accelerating planning and environmental consenting, and we expect network companies to play their part to plan and deliver these projects on time, and they are incentivized to do so. The next generation of system planning will need to look at net zero targets for 2035 and 2050 more widely, and encompass investment across the electricity and gas grids, including the planning for hydrogen infrastructure. And ultimately, we will now need to plan regionally, heavily involving local leaders, as well as creating a national plan. So we are reviewing the institutional framework to set a clear vision for local governance arrangements, looking at a similar model to the future system operator at regional and local level to deliver a more joined up approach, as well as examining the wider roles of markets and institutions at a local level to deliver net zero at lowest costs. Now, we can change the institutions, but we also need to change the market. So moving on to the reform of the wholesale market. Alongside this, working with government, we are considering reforms to the electricity wholesale market. In particular, how to break the link between the price of gas and the price of electricity. In a large measure, the best way to achieve this is to move as quickly as possible from fossil fuel power to renewables and low carbon sources of generation, weakening this link over time. However, the gas crisis revealed that in the short term, consumers may not be getting the full benefit of existing renewable, renewable and low carbon plants. One option is to move all renewable plants onto existing contracts for different regime, which would stop this happening and give consumers access to lower electricity prices. Equally, we need a market that reflects the benefits of using electricity when demand is low and supply is highest, and one that takes into account different locational differences. This is a complex area. As Hannah mentioned, I left, led electricity market reform, so I genuinely know the challenges in changing our energy markets. I also accept the design challenges today are even greater than those we faced in 2010 when we launched electricity market reform. However, this must be done. If not, at best, we will transform into a better energy system, but one that is more expensive than it needs to be. But at worst, we will not make the changes needed and face greater cost and securities of supply consequences. 
Alongside this work, we are looking into ways of tackling grid con congestion. This includes considering incremental forms to the existing mechanism for balancing demand and to more radical measures that might split the wholesale markets so that prices vary across the country depending on the local supply and demand conditions. And finally, moving on to retail market reform. In a world where our energy generation is rapidly decarbonising, with a major acceleration of renewables, nuclear power, and wider local low-carbon electricity storage solutions, we also need to make new arrangements to fundamentally reshape the retail market, both to manage volatility we see today, but also to manage volatility that we might see in the future. To shape this new market, we know that the regulatory and legislative framework around our retail market, as well as its structure, might need to change. For me, this principally means three things in the medium term. First, building a market of financially robust, well-capitalized companies, able to invest and partner with those who are bringing smarter innovations into the markets. And that does mean a market where profits are reasonable. Second, a retail market that treats its customers fairly and reasonably. And third, a changed approach to pricing regulation. In the longer term, we all need to work towards retailers who are sufficiently dynamic and innovative to deliver customers the opportunity to lower bills by changing the way they use their energy. So let me begin with financial regulation and ensuring companies are financially robust. The gas crisis exposed several problems with the preceding retail market model, particularly the large number of supplier failures which occurred at the end of 2021 and early 2022. We carried out a number of actions in response to this, with financial stress tests, strengthening the monitoring and oversight of suppliers, strengthening the market entry process, and extensive use of our compliance and enforcement powers. And despite more difficult conditions this winter, the sector is clearly now in a better place than in 2021, with no major failures to date. We've also learned a number of lessons highlighted by the Oxera report and recent parliamentary reports. To ensure the sector is resilient enough to withstand future shocks, we have laid out a series of proposals to strengthen retail's company's resilience and put the measures we need to have in place to ensure that it happens. And I do need to emphasize, although we've got through this winter, there is more to do to capitalize this sector. We have set out short-term financial controls such as the ring fencing of renewables obligations receipts from the 1st of April, while also setting a clear directory to long-term goals, trajectories to long-term goals, such as increasing the minimal capital buffers for suppliers to reduce the risk of exit and rolling out a new monitoring framework to ensure suppliers' liabilities can be met. This approach is ensuring we can increase resilience while still maintaining a successfully competitive, dynamic and innovative market producing different kinds of services. Now, I recognize there is a balance to be struck here. We do not want to create a cozy market where inefficient incumbents are not challenged, where innovation is stifled, particularly at a time when change is needed in the way retailers work. But equally, we need to ensure that new entrants are properly capitalized, can cope with volatility, and the pace of change that we need to see and do not unnecessarily exit the market. For example, we believe that concerns relating to reliance on customer credit balances can be addressed by strengthening rules around how suppliers can set direct debits to prevent those excessive balances building up while preventing unnecessary costs falling back on customers. For those suppliers who are using customer money irresponsibly, we will take powers to ring fence those deposits and if necessary, prevent further growth or dividends to shareholders for that company. I recognize these measures are controversial. A regulator should never try to, and indeed never can, please everyone. And this is especially true when suppliers have very different business models today, where some will benefit from changes and some won't. We've had criticism from suppliers who are saying we're going far too quickly, 
while others complain we're not going fast enough. Sometimes I've had these criticisms on the same day. Now, there's an informal intuition in any policy and regulation. If you're in that situation, you may well have got things right. Of course, we now have this hard job of calibrating these regulations. We need to move fast enough to improve the capitalization of retailers, but with reasonable plans for transition for companies to make the necessary changes. Ultimately, we have responsibility to ensure the retail market is robust as it can be, with both incumbents and new entrants who are better capitalized and resilient, able to offer a wide range of smart, easy to use products and services, both for household consumers and for businesses. It is my view that by moving to a retail market that is well capitalized and by tackling those unsustainable business models, we will make the market more attractive for new innovation and investment, not less. I'd like now to turn to how suppliers treat their customers. It is vitally important that customer interests are protected and suppliers do not use the gas crisis as an excuse for poor behaviours and sharp practices. We have seen through our consumer research programme that customer satisfaction with their energy suppliers has declined over the past few years, from 75% when we started tracking to 66% in the winter of 2022. So throughout these reforms, accepting the challenges the industry has faced, we need to assure that for all of us, consumers remain our top priority. We need to ensure all customers are dealt with fairly and reasonably and to drive up standards, particularly in a market where the role of people switching between suppliers will not be playing the role perhaps one once Ofgem hoped it would. To ensure this happens, we have moved from a largely reactive model of compliance, where we focused primarily on the worst behaviour after it happened and then enforced on the back of that, to a proactive approach, where we assess suppliers on a range of performance measures systematically. We are doing this through what we're glamorously calling market compliance reviews. A series of deep dives into company behaviour, looking at issues like affordability and customer service, treatment of customers in vulnerable circumstances, and support for those with difficulty paying. This is about focusing on suppliers' policies, governance, and processes to ensure they are achieving good consumer outcomes. Where we have seen issues, we have already taken action. For example, it is very important that customers can trust their direct debit is an accurate reflection of their consumption and are given enough information to understand why they are paying the amount that they are. So as part of our compliance review into direct debits, we requested all suppliers who'd increased the direct debit by more than 100% to look at those again between February and April. This resulted in more than 900,000 customers having their direct debits reviews, adjustments made for any miscalculations, including potential repayments, and consideration of whether goodwill payments were warranted. These reviews are relatively new, and we will continue to work with the industry and consumer groups to improve their use. We will continue to repeat some of them to ensure progress continues to be made on issues that matter most to consumers and adapt them to emerging issues as the need arises. We have a, driven a different approach to compliance to support customers through our rules and to drive improvements. But as I will lay out, there is far more still to do. We do have clear rules on the way vulnerable customers are treated, wrapped up by the principle that they should be treated fairly and that those falling behind with payments should be put on affordable repayment plans. We have strict criteria around mandating customers to move to prepayment meters as a result of customer debt, making it clear to suppliers that if they do make these installations, they have an obligation to ensure that it is safe and reasonable and only carried out as a last resort. In September, we published a market compliance review which assessed the sector's approach to customers who are unable to pay their bills. We examined whether suppliers are proactively identifying customers in payment difficulty, whether repayment rates are being set according to ability to pay, and whether suppliers have appropriate support in place for their customers, such as providing access to emergency credit and signposting to third party help. In almost every case, we identified that suppliers need to improve. 
with three companies in particular raising serious concerns. On the back of this, we enforced against two companies and one paid compensation of over £800,000 to consumers and Ofgem's Consumer Redress Fund. We also wrote to suppliers, clearly setting out their obligations to ensure customers in vulnerable situations are identified, proactively contacted and provided additional support where appropriate. We made it clear that suppliers are expected to always consider the ability to pay before escalating the debt recovery process and that debt recovery actions are fair and proportionate. However, as is clear from the recent Citizens Advice report and reflecting <coughs> legitimate concerns raised this weekend by the Secretary of State, we need to do more. Focused on the way in which suppliers are handling the mandation of prepayment meters for customers who are unable to pay. Ofgem has already heard directly of instances where customers have been switched over to these meters without knowing that it's been done, leading to households being cut off and left with no heating. For example, during our review of how suppliers treat vulnerable customers, we heard directly from an elderly gentleman who thought he'd had a power cut because he'd not been told that he'd been switched over to a prepayment meter. This meant he spent days without light or heat not knowing what was happening. At any time, but particularly in this cold weather, this is obviously unacceptable. This is why we have written to suppliers again today to remind them of their obligations and inform them that we are launching a rigorous market compliance review into self-disconnections, remote switching, and the forced installation of prepayment meters. This will assess how suppliers are complying with existing regulations and expose any unacceptable practice. We welcome the industry's positive engagement on this and encourage suppliers to respond to the Secretary of State's call for transparency on this issue. Alongside this, we will shortly be commencing work looking at whether change is needed in the rules that we set or the guidance that accompanies it, particularly if we find a wide range in the way the current rules are being interpreted. I do need to emphasize that poor supplier behavior is far from universal. Many suppliers, including several represented here today, have been very active in improving their response and improving their processes. I have sat with customer service agents myself and watched exemplary behavior in dealing with what is ultimately a very difficult and complex situation. For example, we welcome those suppliers who have put in place a voluntary pause on debt collection now, when customer service agents do talk to customers in distress, it is clearly a tough job for them. It is clearly a hard balance between protecting against the company running up higher debts, making sure you can recover the money for the energy that you need, and dealing with what is usually a set of difficult circumstances for their customers. But right now, ultimately, it is incumbent on all of us in this industry to identify vulnerable customers and do everything we can to support them. Ofgem's message to suppliers is crystal clear. Now is the time to increase your efforts and do all you can to look after your vulnerable customers. The rules are clear, but they are just a minimum standard. And we would welcome you going further voluntarily as the Secretary of State has suggested. Equally, we recognize despite the positive effects of the energy bills discount scheme, this is an extremely difficult time for businesses. To be clear, Ofgem's remit is to protect the interests of all consumers, including businesses that rely on our industry. We are aware of problems for some businesses getting fixed rate energy deals due to high prices or requests for large deposits from their suppliers. So we are working hard to increase our monitoring across the non-domestic sector carrying out a compliance review to investigate high prices for non-domestic customers and a review of the obligations on suppliers in this area. In the longer term, we are working with the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy on its broader retail market reforms, its wholesale market review and looking at regulatory options for third parties and for brokers. I would like, finally, to turn to the way in which we regulate prices in energy. The price cap was designed with good intentions. It was targeted at the legitimate concern that the industry had been, in effect, 
overcharging those of us who did not shop around and equally prevented a drive for greater efficiency amongst suppliers. In a stable market, the price cap worked well. However, the market today is far from stable, with forward prices for gas and power fluctuating by around 45 to 60 percent in the final quarter of last year alone. As I've said at the start, we do not know the future, but we need a system that is robust in a wide range of scenarios. The problem we face is this, an inflexible price cap combined with a volatile market for buying energy increases the financial risks that suppliers face. This was most evident when, with the price cap only changing every six months, the cost in the formula versus the market price at that time were very different. In October 2021 to March 2022, the assumed value of gas in the price cap calculation was 63 pence per therm, but the market price to buy gas was between around one pounds and five pounds a therm. Now, of course, companies can hedge against the price cap expectations, and there is a methodology that is well known to do so. However, there will always be residual risk, which in a stable market is quite small, but in a volatile market can be quite high. For example, supply that is unused in warm weather or extra demand in cold weather both present risks for suppliers, even when they're well hedged. Now with this system, this will mean over time that companies will need to hold more capital to manage these risks. Ultimately, that needs to be paid for and will increase costs for customers. Now we've already changed the price cap so that it adapts more quickly by changing every three months. On our current projections, although gas prices do remain volatile, the price cap level may fall below the energy price guarantee level in July and possibly do so as early as April. This will save billions of pounds of the expected public spending on that measure. And although highly uncertain, it's possible that prices may fall well below this throughout the summer, which would be welcome news for all customers, both households and business. But even with the reforms we have in place, there is a risk and therefore ultimately a cost that needs to be borne by customers. In addition to the risk of the capital that companies need to hold, we also need to maintain stability in a market that is volatile. Therefore, we have introduced temporary measures like the market stabilization charge. Now, frankly, this is something that none of us would like to see in a market. But with the volatility we have witnessed alongside a blunt price cap, it is needed to maintain market stability and to protect customers of, from the unnecessary costs of unnecessary failure within the retail market. As structured in legislation, the price cap therefore has costs as well as benefits for customers. The government has already stated that it is reviewing the retail price regulation framework, and we welcome that. It is my view that we should be exploring more flexible ways of achieving the aims of the price cap and comparing the costs and benefits of those with the framework that we have today. Accepting that the market has changed, there may well be a better, more flexible way to protect customers' interests, and if it turns out the costs and benefits of those are higher, the benefits of those are higher, then we should pursue actively those options. But we also need to think about affordability and vulnerable customers. So returning to the situation of vulnerable customers, even with the energy price guarantee implemented by government and Ofgem and the wider support in place for families, there are many households that simply cannot afford to pay their energy bills. In simple terms, when their budget is assessed against their income, there is no room necessarily to pay all of current bills. Now, as described, we will be highly active with companies on how they treat customers who fall into arrears. However, the root cause for some customers, despite the enormous widespread support by government, is their inability to pay for their basic energy needs. Therefore, we think there is a case for examining with urgency a social tariff that limits the impact of extremely high prices and reduces volatility 
for a defined set of vulnerable groups. To be clear, this tariff would need to be subsidised when prices are high and preferably pay for through funds raised in a progressive way. There are a wide range of regulatory and policy options that could deliver this, and I recognise there are trade-offs involved that are far beyond a regulator's power or virus to assess. For example, defining the group who have access to a social tariff is hard, with inevitable cliff edges between different groups of people, and any subsidy may well involve public spending, which is not a matter for the regulator. <coughs> This is why, ultimately, as with the strategy to tackle wider affordability of energy, this is a matter for government, and we will work closely with them to explore the full range of options. The energy price guarantee has worked well in protecting all customers and indeed limiting the impact of energy on inflation. But if prices do ease, there may well be a case for focusing any subsequent intervention on those that are most vulnerable. The structure I've outlined for the retail market is what is needed in the medium term. But in the longer term, retailers will need to play a more fundamental role in decarbonisation and in the energy transition. They will be on the front line of persuading customers to install the equipment needed to vary our energy use, where possible, to, to match with times when demand is low and or supply is high. This will mean providing access to new technology products and services that allow consumers to offer flexibility and to be rewarded for doing so. And the pricing, behavioural and financial regulation I have outlined will need to adapt over time to make sure the retail market is able to do this. Not all of this is decided yet, and we will continue to work with government, industry and consumer groups and charities as we shape this approach. And I should just advertise that we are currently consulting on a future work programme for the coming year, which intends to do just that. So, in conclusion, the gas crisis has strengthened the need for pace in changing our energy system to meet customer needs and to meet our low carbon goals. Equally, to respond to the short term market conditions and more fundamental long term change, a dramatically different approach may be needed in our retail sector. A short to do list can be summarised as follows. Set up a future system operator for success by giving it the power to lead the industry and design an energy system that meets our national, regional and local needs. Reform the electricity market to break the link between the price of gas and electricity and ensure customers' benefits. Reform the retail market to make it more financially resilient, to improve company behaviour and to drive up standards. To re-examine our approach to price protection, perhaps through alternatives to the price cap, and move to a model where customers are rewarding for moving the time they use their energy. And finally, consider stronger price protection that limits the impact of extremely high prices for a def defined set of vulnerable groups through a social tariff. I believe that if we follow these actions, we will have a robust path to a better, more secure and low carbon energy system that meets this country's needs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you. Uh, so I'll just put a, a couple of <coughs> questions to Jonathan. If anyone in the room has questions, just be thinking them up, because there will be a waving mic coming around to take those, and we will also take questions that have been coming in online. But just to start, um, Jonathan, from me, um, would you accept that the uh, supplier failures in 21, 22 were, in effect, uh, a symptom of, of regulatory failure? And can you talk us a bit about... talk? Talk to us a bit about how you at Ofgem have been reflecting since mm. what we've experienced in, in <laughs> recent months and years about the balance that you strike as a regulator between uh, the mm. energy system's resilience and all the things you've been talking about in terms of, of, of consumers. Yeah, look, I mean, looking back at 2021, we know the root cause was the beginning of a dramatic change in the cost of our gas and the impact it had on the retail sector. But the way the market was regulated played its part. When I look at some of the players who went out of the market very early, without a doubt, they weren't resilient enough. And when I reflect on the role Ofgem played in that and the thinking within Ofgem, quite frankly, as all the reports we have read and commissioned ourselves have shown us, 
our focus was highly on making sure we had a competitive market and not enough on looking at the resilience of the players involved. So we have thought quite hard and quite deeply, not only about that issue, and that comes to the financial regulation I was describing before, but also about how we run ourselves and how we think about the regulation we take forward. So something which is a fascination to us, but may not be a fascination to everyone, we have laid out what we call a consumer outcomes framework, which actually says, let's be really clear of all the different aspects that are important to customers. And let's be really clear to ourselves and our board as to how those trade off with the policies that play through. And when you look at it through that lens, on both sides, on making that transition that I described, on making sure we have the plan in place, trading off resilience versus cost versus decarbonisation, and equally on the retail side, thinking not only about the number of people switching, but also about how companies are behaving, how we make sure that companies are sustainable, becomes a much richer and much deeper conversation that we're having. So we've tried hard not only to look at the causes of the retail failures, but also what it means for our regulation as a whole. Thank you. And thinking, obviously, for the regulator, you're not operating in a vacuum, you're operating in a, yes. in a political context. To what extent in the past would you say that you know, the need to prioritise competition has been, um, you know, it's been a big emphasis of, of politicians um, and uh, the, you know, the, the importance of not you know, if customer charge is not going up. How, how is it, um, how is it, to what extent would you say that decisions made in Ofgem have been sort of influenced by that? And, and looking forward, we've got the uh, sort of long-awaited strategy and policy statement coming up, yes. which promises to help you balance all these different trade-offs you have to make. Can you tell us a bit about what you're hoping to see from that to help you actually make those trade-offs in future? Well, uh, um... I think, without a doubt, there was a consensus. You go back to 2015, everybody wanted more competition, lower barriers to entry. And there was frustration, understandable frustration, that we had what felt like a fairly cosy oligopoly that didn't seem to be driving the change that we needed. So that, I think, was agreed both politically with all parties and indeed with Ofgem. But I don't think that's a reason why Ofgem can point back and argue that's why we had the regulations we had. You're independent for a reason. And the reason we're independent is because we need to find a way to navigate through some of the short-term political debates that you have. Um, so in a sense, I think as we evolve as a regulator, you need to think hard about your role and to make sure that you are thinking about all the different trade-offs you face and you stand back a bit from the political fray. And do you feel that the, you talked about the, the enormous task there is in terms of establishing the infrastructure which will be required yes. for the transition to net zero. Yes. Do, you, do you feel that the, the focus on price has discouraged investment in that by, by the companies uh, required to make that transition? So I, I don't actually. I, I think when you look at the history of price controls, and I say I've got some colleagues in the ground who we've been sort of debating this with at length, and you look at the cost of capital that's been offered and you look at the way the revenues are calculated, I don't think it was simply a drive to reduce costs. I think that the price control framework that we had is quite incrementalist. It just takes time. Now, to do your job as a regulator properly, a company comes to you and says, I want to spend a billion pounds of someone else's money to build something. You've got to be confident that it's needed. So you will spend time checking, challenging, and making sure that each piece of infrastructure is needed incrementally. The reason why I'm enthusiastic about the role of the system operator is you have a much better way of doing that when you're thinking about the change as a whole. So rather than debating sort of each link that goes between North Scotland and the islands, if you have the sense there is a holistic plan there, our job becomes simpler. It becomes about making sure that's built efficiently and quite frankly built quickly. So the way we've designed it is yes to make sure that people are building and using the, the cost that they need to, to make that efficiently, but also big incentives to make sure that happens on time. Right now, a year's delay is expensive. So what I say to the network companies is, we've done our job. You've got 20 billion pounds program to build. Now you do your job and make sure that infrastructure happens on time. And just to broaden out a bit, um, Bayes has just uh, announced its uh, review of economic regulation of utilities. Yes. To what extent would you say that the sort of challenges you face as, as a regulator are, are specific to, to your area that you're regulating, or do you see common challenges across the utilities? Well, well let's start with. A, sorry, I didn't ask the question on strategy and policy statements. Let's oh, start yes, with that's that. That's true. And, and that's a good a good place to start for energy because you know I have the benefit of working both sides of the camp in government and in the regulator. So I've kind of seen this and in the industry indeed. So I've seen this from all angles. 
And without doubt, there is a much more shared challenge than we would have had 20 years ago. So quite frankly, 20 years ago, government used to push a lot to off chairman and really hold its hands up and say, right, well, that's a matter for the regulator. Now, all the questions we try and answer, so the pace at which we build out, the, the charges that we make, the incentives for renewables, are somewhat divided between us and government. So I do think we need to work closely. And what I hope to see from the strategy and policy statement is a sense of the government's ambitions. So what makes my job easier is if I have more confidence that the DFT's plans for charge points are set at a certain level, which means, again, we can calibrate the planning that we're doing to meet those needs. So I think there is something in my mind that is probably particular to energy. But my view is regulators as a whole have a phenomenal opportunity to support economic growth in this country. So when I think about review of regulation as a whole, I don't think that is well expressed in our legislative framework, and I don't think that's well expressed in the way that we work with government. So you know, if you look at water, telecoms, energy, all of us do something that can absolutely drive growth. And equally, as was put to me by one Secretary of State, all of us, if we choose to, can be quite a heavy blocker. So I'd love to see that review tackling that jointly with us so that we can play our part in the ecosystem that, quite frankly, needs all the levels that are non-fiscal to make sure we grow over the next 10 or 15 years. Thank you very much. OK, we'll go to some questions from the room. We'll take them in groups of three. If you wouldn't mind saying uh, who you are and where you're from. Hi, hi, Jonathan. My name is Michael Morn. I'm a, a director at Max iTech. We are currently developing energy storage technology, right, relatively new to, the, um, new to the energy sector, but not a new company by any stretch. Um, so uh, energy storage was recognised by Ofgem as, as being key. And I'll use this as, a, as an example here because it's pertinent to us. But yes. you mentioned innovation quite extensively throughout um, your, your talk there. Um, so energy storage, as, as we see it, is, is key to, to things like uh, uptake of renewable energy, um, mitigating uh, constraint payments, uh, reducing the requirement for, for grid um, resilience and upgrade, um, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I'm aware of Ofgem's SIF funding, and we've been interfacing with the, with the SIF team over the last six or so months. Um, but as an SME and, and working on, on new technology, uh, I'm just wondering if there are plans with an off-gem because I, I was concerned to see how little investment there was in energy storage technology, particularly through SIF sure. funding. And certainly there are no themed calls through UKRI or for the BEIS. <coughs> I'm just wondering if there are plans from off-gem to change a, a, the way that they interface with uh, the likes of innovative SMEs, research institutes, but also as as up-and-coming heat network operators are, are coming online, local authorities who might be running mm. quite significant heat networks, whether or not funding may be, the, the structure for funding may change, and whether, um, uh, essentially, whether we're going to see any differences going forward. Because uh, we are finding it challenging at the moment to, as an SME, to, to interface with the energy industry, uh, but also to... Yeah, yeah. Okay. Second guess what almost what the energy industry is looking for. Uh, we can put proposals forward, but the, as there's no themed call, we, we don't really know whether we're, we're ticking all the boxes. So. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hugh Lloyd. Hello, Jonathan. Thank you. Um, it, it feels to me like, you know, the journey that the energy system is going on is one that's going to have to start recognising things that are behind metres. So what happens in homes, what happens in Absolutely. commercial premises and things like that. And actually, we're moving to a world where if flexibility is going to be important because it saves costs, actually, we're getting into a co-productive environment. Yep. And co-production might be the EV owner who's put solar on their house because actually that's cheaper for them to power their car. Then they put a battery in. They've now got a B to G building to grid capability. It might be the local authority that looks at their fleet and realises the cost of their own electricity could be... 20% of um, diesel and quite a lot cheaper than grid electricity. So how do you feel that for, sort of, you know, your challenge to the future of regulation, how do these co-producers, none of whom are in the energy system, how do they actually get to be a fair part of the system? Because otherwise, we'll miss out on those opportunities. Thanks. And the gentleman behind. Hi, uh, Gareth Evans, Watersway Associates. 
The question um, I have really is, it was very interesting, I think there was a reference in the start about um, how maybe we should look at how the wholesale market works, particularly maybe uh, moving to a series of wholesale markets rather than one that's GB wide. Um, considering the, the kind of the, the role, the obvious role that liquidity has in making sure the market is as efficient as possible and would be a key way of removing that link between wholesale gas price and power price, is this something that we need to look at as kind of a focus, the liquidity of the market? I think it's safe to say a lot of people would say liquidity could be improved and will need to improve as we move to a more kind of flexible and dynamic market with more players in it. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have energy storage, we have uh, co-production, and we have liquidity even more. So let's start with liquidity. I mean, I think when you look at the market, particularly in the last quarter of last year, we, we did face liquidity problems because we were seeing extraordinarily vol volatility. So trying to trade out in the future became very difficult. And I think when you, we begin to look, for example, at the non-domestic market, that will be one of the drivers for the situation between retailers and companies that we need to understand. So in short, yes, we do need to look at liquidity. We need to think about what we can do in regulatory terms and indeed how our retail policy is affecting that. Um, on both behind the meter and storage, we are, first of all, absolutely open to innovation funding. So if you want to talk to us about how we might reconfigure some of the funds that are available, we're happy to do that. There are limits on what a regulator can do, and I'm afraid I hate to bring it down to this, but we can only regulate licensed companies. So funding go, needs to go through licensed companies. But we're very keen to have a conversation about what we could do or indeed what we could do in, in kind of collaboration with government. And Hugh, your question on kind of co-production, how you get sort of stuff behind the meter and how you get customers more heavily involved in this, in my mind, is the fundamental sort of long-term change we need to make to the way we buy and sell energy. So ultimately, we want companies that are offering to do everything for your house. They're offering to make changes in your home that bring new technologies in, that allow you to respond in a much more dynamic way than all of us will be responding to Finton's call tonight to be more flexible between the hours of X and Y, whatever they are. And, and so I think that is the design challenge. And for me, part of what we're seeing organically is retailers taking that on. But that means a very, very different retail model from one where you're selling vanilla products. When we look at that very long term, there are <coughs> other options, such as longer term relationships between customers and suppliers. But in my mind, it really is allowing the really sort of edge pushing companies to take that role on and make sure they're providing access to all those companies that are trying to play that intermediate option. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to take, there's a question online from Vincenzo Rampula, who says, how important is digital and data transformation for Ofgem? What developments do you want to see over the next couple of years and what are the challenges to that? There's a question over here, I think, Oren. Thank you. Um, it's Graeme Hiscott from the Daily Mirror. Uh, you talked about how um, uh, prices are um, unlikely to, to come back to pre-pandemic levels, which is going to be sobering, for, I think, for a lot of people. Um, you also mentioned about social tariffs, which will perhaps help um, maybe in the future. But uh, do you think there's a role for, to, for the government to play in terms of continuing um, uh, support for particularly those perhaps beyond that, that vulnerable group that, uh, that so, so continuing need for some sort of assistance from, from the taxpayer. And if I wouldn't, if you don't mind, if I can just tag on one, which is also about support for businesses. You mentioned in your speech about the, um, the, the big impact that wholesale prices are having. And, and obviously we're also going to see a big drop in the level of support for those companies from April. Are you concerned that there's, um, there's going to be a high, le high number of failures if there isn't more support? from the government. And just to clarify, you mean failures of business customers? Into, yeah, on yeah. that second point, yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you. The lady here. Thank you. Hello, Jill Havenhand um, from a um, business consumer company, Prora Limited. Um, this is basically relating to the targeted charging review. We're talking a lot about flexibility and um, how people use their power. Um, my company and a lot of very small companies and research establishments are being caught out by TCR insofar as it, um, it assumes that everybody is using their power in the same way, and that is absolutely not the case. We all have very different and very unique power usage profiles, and we're being caught foul of TCR. So this precedes um, wholesale markets, the unit cost of power. Um, we're just into the first stage of TCR where the distribution charges are being implemented. We're now waiting, but 
have no sight of what we're going to be charged in April for the transmission charges and the SCR charges which are going to come into play. And as a very, very small company, we are really, really vulnerable. Um, and when you're a specialist company, we, we are a tier one supplier to the defence industry. Um, we are critical to the supply chain. And really, the situation is quite desperate. And we would really, really welcome some dialogue. OK, so two linked questions there about business vulnerability, yes. um, data and digital, and uh, yet yeah, the wider question about support for vulnerable customers. Sure. Well, let's take data and digital first of all and just think about what we're trying to achieve here. So, you know, for me, the first half of this transition today has been one where we have focused on changing how electricity is generated. So electricity market reform, that thing I was involved in before, was all about how you pay someone to build wind farms to feed into the system. The second half of this is really going to be about changing the way we use our energy, about targeting our energy at different times and indeed in different locations. And data is fundamental to that. So we see data as having a really important role in the transition and also throwing up new regulatory questions. So who owns data? Who has access to that data? How do we prevent companies from hoarding information which prevents the system from being operated as efficiently as it can? So I think it is, it's already a priority for us, but I think it's a priority that will grow over time. Now, in terms of my views of government action and short-term assistance, you'll probably understand I've gone as far as I can by proposing a social tariff to be looked at, um, and indeed one that's looked at from a progressive tax base, which I should add, energy bills are not a progressive tax base, is probably as far as I can go. All I'd note is that I've, I've never seen a time, in fact, I don't think any of us in this room can remember a time when government has intervened as heavily as it has in both the domestic and the business market today. Um, in terms of concern for businesses, there is no doubt with the cost changes we have seen, there are risks for businesses. Now, it's not my job to trade that off against fiscal decisions. And so what we do within Ofgem is look hard at the market and make sure that within those conditions, customers are being treated reasonably. And that's part of the reviews that I mentioned. And coming on to TCR, I think what we should do is two things. First of all, I'd like to come and talk to my team in detail so we can get under the skin of the concerns that you have. But what we are trying to do there is to begin to adapt the charging regime to this world where many of us are generating our own power and our own electricity. But it's not the end of the story. So I expect charging reform to continue. And I hope through that we can address some of the concerns that you've raised. OK, just um, building on your, that, the data and digital question, which is very interesting. Do you feel that the government of gem companies have good enough data to understand who and where vulnerable customers actually are? So, I mean, the short answer is, is not yet. Certainly not to the level that we need to have. I think it goes well beyond that. I think, you know, it would be good to know what is used on the system when, so that companies like the gentleman here described can come in and take advantage of where there are issues and congestion and can begin to build business models around that. But if you want a serious system, that's going to tackle vulnerability. That means all of us working together to make sure that we share our data and our data is used between different agencies. You know, one thing I ought to sort of plug personally is we ought to be thinking between regulators and between sectors how we collectively identify vulnerable customers. It's a kind of personal frustration of mine and indeed of many of my CEO colleagues that we are not better at creating a more universal system of targeting vulnerability so we don't have customers having to go two or three times to different parts of their, their own system, to their, to their phone, to their bank, to off-gem, to empty energy companies, to register the fact that they have needs. We ought to be able to do better than that. Thank you. Okay, I think we've got time for just a couple more questions in the room. There's a lady at the front here. Um. Hi, hi, Jonathan. Um, my name is Vasundara. I'm representing ADBA, uh, the Arabic Digestion and Bioresources Association. Uh, we are representing the ADs and biogas, biomethane sector in the UK. Right. So one of the questions I had, like I'm, I've been dealing with Ofgem a lot um, on behalf of the AD sector. So we've been getting complaints uh, from our members a lot, um, the AD plant developers and operators saying that they can't um, export additional energy to, to the uh, electricity grid in the country. Uh, the AD sector now export like 19 uh, terawatt hours, 
and we have like the potential to export 54 plus terawatt hours by 2030 at full potential. So with even with the net zero review and everything is urging that we need to increase renewable energy production, et cetera, mm -hmm. and you were also talking about that as well. So we have been getting complaints saying that the, um, uh, the grid is not allowing the operators and developers to export additional energy mm. and giving different excuses, different you have reasons. A yeah, so I just want to <laughs> ask regarding that, um, you as the uh, energy regulator, what is your approach to uh, contract this challenge for a sector like biogas sector? So I think I need to just, just perhaps when I come to you, I'll just clarify where the blocker is and then we can take it from there. Do this gentleman have a question? Final question. Uh, from Max Consultancy. Um, the question is to extend from the gentleman in the Daily Mirror, the question about the business support. I would be interesting to know the statistic of the number of business consumers actually listening to this talk today. Um, and the proportion allocated to that specific question. Um, regards to this review for business support from 1st April, what is the name of this review and how do we follow up on it? Okay, um, so on that question, do you mean the review that Ofgem is carrying out? Yes. So we are not carrying out the review of government's support that's a matter of a government. What we are doing, doing is running a compliance review that is looking into the operation of the business market and making sure we understand whether there has been any behaviour of concern by suppliers that are providing energy to business customers. Now, we have Neil Lawrence, my director of retail. I'm sure we'll be able to pick up the details of how that's going forward and what's happening. So I'll, I'll leave you two to talk that through. And on biogas and export of electricity, can you just explain to me what's the, what's the thing that's in your way? What's stopping that happening? So most of, the, most of my, um, our members have been saying it's either uh, no, like no infrastructure, we don't have enough uh, capacity in infrastructure to export energy. Oh, uh, I see. I remember you also talked about that just now. But I think it's, it's the only excuse we've been getting. And we feel like it's like an excuse because... In, oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. We, do it. <laughs> So um, we do have, I think, in, in the system we have today, we have the beginning of, of stresses around this big transition we're describing. So you've, talk, you've heard me talk about the big plans and how we're going to build out and how we're going to make sure we do all that quickly. What we've also got to do is make sure that probably people like your clients and, your, and the people that's part of your association are able to connect to the grid as quickly as possible. Now, it's my feeling that the issue there is around how we run the connections process and how we allow people access to that grid. And there are some technical changes we can simply make to, to the way we organise the queues that I think would make a big difference. So my team with the system operator are working really hard to make sure that we address that, because I agree with you, there are many people like you who want to get on the grid and can't do in a time frame that makes sense. Jonathan, thank you so much for your time okay. today. Thank you. Will you join me in thanking Jonathan for his words? Thanks very much.